Morning. Will you please join me for the call to worship? People of God, we come today to worship God, who is our strength and our firm foundation. We come to offer praise and prayer to listen for the voice of our still speaking God and to be renewed and refreshed through the word and through the sacraments. So now, people of God, rise as you're able in body and spirit and sing with joy of our unstoppable God. God, we thank you for this day, for we know that this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice, and we're glad to be in it. Be with us now on this day as we come to worship, but come to worship you through your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. 
Good morning. You may be seated. Welcome to worship here in Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church on this wonderful 4th of July weekend. It's a little weary outside, but I think it's supposed to get nicer as the day goes on. But um, welcome to worship. If you're worshiping with us online, we welcome you. We invite you to click on the QR code or scan the QR code that's on your screen to check in and let us know that you're worshiping with us this morning. You can also put your prayer request and praise request also on that uh, QR code when you uh, scan it. Uh, but we welcome you to worship on this day. A few announcements before we go into uh, worship. Today after worship is our monthly uh, cake uh, anniversary and birthday cake fellowship. So stick around for some cake following worship uh, this morning. Uh, just in observance of uh, 4th of July, the church offices will be closed on Monday and Tuesday this week, um, since 4th of July is on Tuesday. So just be aware that there will be no office assistance if you need anything. Um, uh, two weeks from today, uh, we will have brunch with the pastor, uh, brought it back since the last month we fell on Father's Day, so we didn't uh, try to compete with all the restaurants for Father's Day. But um, join us for brunch with the pastor on the 16th, following worship at 1230 at our usual location at Central. Last week I mentioned that um, along with the other uh, ecumenical churches in our uh, clergy cohort, along with the Interfaith uh, Conference of, uh, of Milwaukee, we are engaging in what they call Amazing Faith Dinners, or Dialogue. It's a uh, monthly dialogue that has been created to bring all the inner uh, interfaith and all the ecumenical folks together in just a uh, light dinner with uh, just some ecumenical um, Conversation and it's not all faith based. It's just uh, pretty much, you know, just bringing us all together and just having fellowship and and getting to know one another and just having some dialogues through uh, what we call these amazing faith dinners. If you're interested, um, the the July one is on the 26th. It's being held at the uh, uh, I'm drawing blank, but it's uh, being held uh, at the Islamic Centers uh, uh, of. Milwaukee over on Layton and uh, or on on Layton. Um, if you want to uh, attend, you can uh, go to your weekly um, and check. There's a, a box to click. Also, I have it on our Facebook page, and I'll try to put it on the website if you're interested. But um, join us for that on Sunday, August the sixth, which is a month from this uh, Sunday. We are going to incorporate and start a new style of worship call our contemporary worship. So on the first Sunday of each month, we're going to change things up a little bit and make it a little bit more contemporary and a little bit more modern and see if we can bring some other folks in from out in the community to maybe worship with us in a different style of worship. We will do that each first Sunday of the month, uh, starting uh, on August the 6th. And then on that first Sunday, also after that worship, we will have our all-church picnic. Uh, weather permitting, it'll be outside. Um, or inside, outside, but uh, stick around for um, a picnic and uh, fellowship on, on that particular Sunday. And I think that's all the announcements that I have for this morning. So as we continue with worship, let us hear God's word. Good morning. Our epistle lesson comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 44 through 50, taken from the inclusive Bible. The kingdom of heaven is like a buried treasure found in the field. The ones who discovered it hid it again, and rejoicing at the discovery, went and sold all their possessions and bought the field. Or again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant's search for fine pearls. When one pearl of great value was found, the merchant went back and sold everything else and bought it. Or again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea, which collected all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishers hauled it ashore. Then sitting down, they collected the good ones in a basket and threw away those that were of no use. This is how it will be at the end of time. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the just and throw the wicked into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May God bless the hearing of these sacred words.
you please rise as you're able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from John's gospel, chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, taken from the inclusive Bible. I am the true vine, and my Abba is the vine grower who cuts off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, but prunes the fruitful ones to increase their yield. You've been pruned already, thanks to the word that I have spoken to you. Live on in me as I do in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself apart from the vine, neither can you bear fruit apart from me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who live in me and I in them will bear abundant fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Those who don't live in me are like withered, rejected branches to be picked up and thrown on the fire and burned. If you live on in me and my words live on in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. You know what the scripture says today? Thanks, Thanks to God. God. Amen. Even when we stumble and we struggle, you're always right there. So prepare within us, O oh God, as we open our hearts and our minds and our spirit to be renewed and be transformed by the words that are spoken this day, so that the renewing in our minds and that we may become more Christ-like in all our ways. Now, God, I ask that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day, and the words that come from my mouth, along with the meditations on each and every one of our hearts. Be they ever acceptable to you, in Christ we pray, amen. Well, this morning we start what I'm calling our summer, our summer seven sermon series. Say that three times fast this morning. And hopefully it will challenge us over the next seven weeks with a spiritual maturity as we go through summer. You know how much I like to preach topically and connect our sermon series together. And this particular series will be a little bit different, that each sermon will pretty much over the next seven weeks, what I call, be standalone, but in the same sense, will be connected. And if you're not familiar with what a standalone sermon is, they are exactly what they have been given. They are standalone. So if you miss a week over the next seven weeks, you're not going to have to go back and watch all of my past sermons over the series, but if you want to, it's a nice, nice gesture. But um, you don't have to, you won't have to go back. It'll be, each week will have its own pretty much standalone topic. So seven, seven separate topics over seven weeks, but I will say that over those next seven weeks, the topics will, con will connect, I can't get words out this morning, of having to do with summer. And I couldn't think of a better subject to start off with of the topic of our priorities. 
So here we are in July and hopefully within your families, those of you who have had to deal with graduations and weddings and all those typical activities that have come to pass, that it isn't the sign that summer is over. It just means that we're in the midst of the summer beginning. With all of that, what do we usually think when it comes to summer? Well, I think of lots of vacation or camping or what I call in the state glamping for a lot of us that we go up to our trailers instead of going and pitching tents or those wild pool parties that you may be throwing or maybe it's time to clean out the house and have a garage sale or something to that nature. And more than likely, I probably need to have some of those and get rid of the stuff that I have laying around the house at, at some point. But it's also about those projects that you started and that they're still sitting there from last summer. Or maybe it's that you are going to all of the fests this year. Summer fest, Greek fest, Italian fest, or I can't think of all the different fests that we have, but that usually happens one right after another all the way up until we get into September. For me, I personally like what they call chill on the hill in my neighborhood. It's that summer, summer evenings on Tuesdays at Humboldt Park where you get to hear different bands and different types of music and just go out and chill in your lawn chair and have a glass of wine and just enjoy the evening. But with all these happenings during the summer, often it's time that we think of being on break. I think it's that we call summer our summer break, right? I mean, we are taking a break from all that we've been doing, our regular routines, those of you who have families, a lot of times, you know, the kids are out during the summer for the most part. It's just breaking away. But then we get into fall and winter and then spring, and then we're back into that routine. We're into that mundane day after day, especially if you have relationships or families. You're just back to that old schedule of activities. But summer is a time that there are those demands in our daily life. But it also allows us to take those breaks and those breathers, and even God attends for humans to be able to have that spirit and to take that rest and take that break. We know that one of the things that are instituted that we get from God is what we call our Sabbath, which usually is on Sunday. We all know that when you work really hard for those six days, that on that seventh day, you just want to rest. But also being able to acknowledge who God is and what we've been given to do on that seventh day. I think that summer is like for us that we have the season of going and going and going, and then we have that time, we just pull back. However, as a pastor, here's my two cents worth about summer. The more and more of us, as we get into the summer routine, taking breaks from things, we also take that break from God or from church. I honestly couldn't tell you that it becomes that partially involved in the midst. We take vacation, we take this, we take time off. So it's like, well, we should take time off from church too. But when we do that, it detours our relationship from God. Summer doesn't just mean that the heat index goes up and I can pull out my lawn chair and kick off on the backyard or the balcony, sipping on my old fashioned with a little umbrella in it or watch the people pass by. This is not summer giving us permission just to kick back and let things pass. Rather, God expects us not to sit back and to be a part of that race still. If you recall some of the words from the Apostle Paul where, where Paul says, you have to run the race. But in order to run the race, we'll have to actually be in it. As we're running to win that prize that God has called us towards, which we know is heaven. If we go back a little bit in Matthew from the readings, we hear the, in the verses right around probably Matthew 6, it says, Seek first 
God's reign and God's justice and all these things will be given to you besides even of worrying about tomorrow oh excuse me enough worrying about tomorrow let's tomorrow take care of itself today has its own troubles of its own so what we're being told here is God is to be first in our lives and that includes the summer as well, meaning that this should be our first priority, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But there's that temptation, especially when it comes to summer, because we let all the other things in our life take priority. Instead of God, we have sometimes no explanation because it's all of a sudden we're going about our summer. We find how sometimes we drop the ball. It's like, okay, well, I better pick up where I left off last summer because I didn't get that project done, so maybe I better get to it. But I'm going to also say that this is really how we shouldn't be spending our summer. I mean, if we live our life to the fullest, we then are to do the exact, exact opposite of the temptation of not wanting to still be connected with God. So instead of letting God fall down to the bottom of the priority list, we need to instead to put God at the top of the list. Thus, part of the sermon, that if we put God at the top and not at the bottom, then things will keep continue moving. We heard in the epistle lesson this morning, which came from Matthew further in, that a couple of those parables are reminding us of what I think may be the important truth. I'm not going to reread the entire epistle lesson, but we heard that in the kingdom of heaven and what you think it's all about. But it's burying that treasure found in a field and what life looks like if we were in a world to be with God. But it also means that not everyone is going to come across that treasure that's hidden in that field as we heard. Meaning that we're all not going to end up with God because of this particular treasure. But those who go after it or who seek it, well, then we heard that the man found he, was, he went right back out and hid it again. While at the same time, through this man's joy of finding this treasure, he went and sold everything he had. And he ends up going and buying the field that we heard about in the beginning of the lesson this morning. And back in the day, it wasn't one of those finders, keepers, losers, weepers, because Back then, if you found something that was on someone else's property, it still wasn't yours. It was theirs because it was their property. So when this man finds the treasure, and because it wasn't in his field, he went back and hid it again to go back and discover it at a later time. And then what does he do? We hear that he sells everything he has in order to buy the deed for that particular property so that treasure could be his. And then we heard the parable about the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant's search for a fine pearl. When one pearl of great value was found, the merchant went back and sold everything else to buy that one pearl. Here we see the merchant who is dealing in pearls and comes across this one absolutely amazing pearl that he has to have. It's a perfect pearl. As he comes across it, it was like, okay, now what? He too went and sold everything that he had in order to go back and buy this one particular pearl. You see, we have a pearl merchant who has pearls. Of course, all these beautiful pearls, his black pearls, his white ones, some big, some small, his entire pearl inventory he sells all to get that one particular pearl. So I ask, what are we supposed to learn from all this? What is scripture really teaching us? Basically, what is the point that we're trying to make, right? Well, the point is, is that life with God is so valuable that we should do everything in our power to obtain it. And having Christ reigning in our heart is worth that weight in gold. 
and we should pretty much liquidate everything we have and we should be willing to get rid of everything and anything that we should be willing to sacrifice all that we have in order to secure ourselves not only with God but with Jesus as well being a part of our lives I want to say that if you lose all of your earthly possessions I mean everything that you have if you have to leave it behind just for God well sometimes we say now what? I think God would consider that one awesome trade-off to begin with, but it also, as the parable says, is that God is that important to do that. And I'm sure maybe some of us are scratching our heads saying, okay, well, what's the trade-off? Because in the long run, God is the ultimate of what we get and what we're searching for. Whatever in your life that you're searching for or you're longing for, maybe it's that perfect job. Maybe it's that perfect piece of property. Maybe it's that perfect pearl. Maybe it's just being in a perfect family since maybe you never had that growing up. Whatever it is in your life, there are those things that we are longing for and right now in our lives and all those things that we're searching for is a part of that. And that God is that individual that we need to continue to seek in order to continue to long for what we want. That might be why so many of us like summer so much that we don't have to overthink of what's going on or shoveling that snow that we did in the, in the winter or keeping the house in order or even trying to find some semblance of peace in our lives. But we need to find that place of longing within ourselves. And I will tell you that peace that we have in searching for it can only continue us to get closer to God and to Jesus. This is why scripture is trying to teach us that if we put God first and foremost above anything in our lives, that when we do that, everything for that, to strive for it, it'll be given back to us tenfold. And I tell you, without God doing this, I can probably tell you that your summer may be just an average summer. Without God being a part of it, your summer is just going to end up being maybe what they call fake peace. We were reminded of Jesus' words this morning in the Gospel lesson of John where we hear, I am the vine. And you can't help but not know that he's teaching us something here. I am the vine and you, you are the branches. And from what Jesus continues to tell us that those who live within me and I in them bear that abundant fruit. But apart from all that, we can do nothing. So for all you gardeners out there with the green thumbs, me not being one of them, that we all know that when you graft something, meaning that when you take a branch and cut it off and graft it into the vine, that there's a reason that we're doing that. We're doing it so the vine will get that giving of that nourishment and nutrients that come from the vine and that when you consider the vine itself, it's going to then sustain the branches and then produce those leaves and then which will then produce the fruit. And within our lives, we are connected to those vines, meaning that we're connected to Jesus, and that when we put Jesus first and we get connected to him, then guess what? The sustaining nutrients of that grace is growing and is going to flow back into our lives, which then turns us to grow even further and to produce more abundantly. Believe it or not, that's how we are kind of connected with God. I recently heard a commentary from a pastor who used an example from this author by the name of Gary Thomas, who wrote this book called Sacred Pathways. And I sort of investigated the book a little bit and the premise of the book that it lies around the beliefs that different people are very different and wired with their connections with God. <laughs> in so many vast different ways. The book goes on to describe some of those different pathways and different ways people connect with God. And one of those pathways this guy talks about is what they call a relational pathway, which describes that you take the pathways and that relationship with a connection in which you make that dialed connection within ourselves and God, and that basically it's like we're scheduling time for our spirituality. 
And then he brings up what he calls an intellectual pathway. And maybe that might be the type that, that you may be. Where it's that intellectual of that various of where God's characteristics possess through that sovereignty and basically triggering your intellect with God. Another way these pathways of this author mentions what he calls a serving pathway, which we pretty much is what you think it is. It's pretty much serving. Serving through your spiritual connection unless you're thinking of going down a different path. And that can be the context of being involved in so many different things when we are on a serving pathway serving within the church, serving within our community, serving within our own jobs, that these people are considered the doers. These are the people that are serving and all of a sudden bring life back into everything. Another one of these pathways is called a creating pathway. And if you go down this pathway, that you cannot help but be connected through God when you're basically out as they call it, in nature. You're surrounded by the beauty of God throughout the universe, and when you're there, you're just taking it all in. It's like going and sitting out on the front lawn and just basking in of what's out there. And then there is this pathway called a worship pathway. And if you relate to that pathway, you find yourself wanting and yearning to be closer to God. You might have a little bit of a terrible day and then you're dealing with all of these huge decisions, but you still are yearning to have God to be a part of that direction in your life. And I could go on and on with all of these pathways. There were quite a number of them in this particular book. But all we need to really do is to discover what our priority is that brings us down whichever pathway that we may need to be connected with God. And once we do that, then you need to design your own spiritual direction. And when you, design, when you design and find your spiritual direction, it will take you down whatever specific pathway that you're geared to go down. And if you want to put God first in your life, then you have to do it almost on a daily basis. You need to put that priority into your life, and I'm telling you that it's not an easy thing to do. But something that you might want to challenge yourself with over the rest of the summer of when I put God first, then what happens in my life? As I was preparing the sermon, which took a lot longer than it usually does for me this week, it sort of stretched my mind of how my connection is with God and what God is calling me to do in my life. And what makes me come alive through my ministry when I seek God's guidance. <coughs> so I challenge you, like I said, the remainder of the summer to try to find your pathway and maybe continue putting God first through your priorities and everything else second. And when you're able to figure out what that connection is, then lean into it and pursue it. If it's relational, then spend time during the week with the people in a spiritual setting, maybe talking about God. Or if you're intellectual, then dig through those materials that will help you bring yourself closer and pursue whatever that intensity is. But all we need to do is that we just want to be sure that we do that in the path that is designed for us and only you know what that pathway is. We just want to make sure that we, we shine in every moment that we have in our lives. So as we continue over these next seven weeks with these seven different topics, these summer seven, um, it'll be interesting to see how we connect all that with our lives through summer. So I bring blessings to each of you this morning. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here, whether in person or if you're out there online. Uh, please note uh, that you can like us and make a comment if you so will, so we know that you're out there and joining us. Uh, always the reminder to fill out your attendance card and uh, if you have a prayer request or a pra praise of thanksgiving please fill that out on the back uh, I'm up here to remind you what these baskets mean to you and to me as they come around remember that this church is here because of all of you and the support that you give 
So when they come around, it is a thank you to all of you for either your donations or your personal giving, your talents, whatever it may be. But because of you, that's why we're here. So thank you for all of that. And also remember, be safe and be careful, but enjoy the 4th of July. Thank you. As we come to the table this morning, will you come to prayer with me? You have invited us to this place, accepting God, for this is where you want us. Right here, we learn to trust you and to faithfully follow where you lead us. Here we learn to listen to you and to hear the words of life and of hope and of healing. Here we learn to bring everything to you, even our pains, especially our brokenness, that we might be made whole. Pilgrim Jesus, you are with us in this place and every place where we live, work, play, and pray. And if we dare to trust this good news, we discover that grace which sets us free to treat one another as siblings and that grace to break down every barrier to live, that grace in every moment of our lives. We should receive you in our hearts. An abiding spirit, knowing that you have brought us together for the gift of the presence. We are no longer strangers, but friends and neighbors in your kingdom. God and community, holy and one, hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy dominion come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the dominion and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord who provides be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts to the one who frees us from sin. We rejoice in God who delivers us from that power. Offer songs of joy and wonder to the one who welcomes you to this table. Who will sing to God and our lives, our hearts, and our souls. With great joy and thanksgiving, we lift our songs and praise to you, God of life. You did, with, you did not withhold your treasures from us and poured them out of the overflowing abundance for us. Sparkling streams rolling clear and clean carpets of grass through which the wind tiptoes. Crystal blue skies freckled with blue bright skies and blowing clouds. All was created and called good by you and offered as gifts to us. But when we could have danced through Eden, free of joys, we chose to let sin blind us, placing us on death's altars. When we refused to answer you when you called us in the night, we then turned to deaf ears to the prophets that you sent to us and to withhold only to your son, the child who loved the most of all, sent Jesus to come to provide us with a way home to your heart. So we lift our voices filled with joy, joining them as the glad songs that we sing in every place and generation, all creation, as we praise your name. and upon these gifts you provided the bread and the fruit of the vine. Let the bread we break and the cup we bless speak to us of the presence of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and all who follow Christ's way, that we may be in one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. You are holy God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus the Christ, your child, our Lord, whom you sent to live among us. 
Faithful and holy are you, creator of all, and blessed is Jesus the Christ. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread at the end of the meal from the table, blessed it, broke it, and gave thanks, and said to them to take and to eat, as this is my body given for you. And each time that you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. And again, when the meal was over, as he took the cup, he gave thanks and blessed it, and he offered it to them, saying to, to drink from this cup and drink from it often, for this is the cup of my new covenant and my love, which is poured out for you and for all the people for the forgiveness of sin. And as often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. For when we eat and drink from this cup, we remember the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? As we come to your table of peace and hope, pour out your spirit upon these gifts of the bread and the cup and upon your children gathered in your name. As we are nurtured by the bread of life, may we have no fear, but boldly go to serve those cast out by the world. As we are nourished with the wine and the drink of the wonder, may we not keep your love at a great distance and secret but to shout the good news of your salvation to all. And when we have all been baptized into the death like Christ and raised into the life with you, we will join our voices with our sisters and brothers singing your glory forever, God and community, holy and one. Amen. Each and every day, let us go out to the world through God's tender mercies, love, and protection that is given to each and every one of us. 
known to us and given to us to God the Creator, God the Savior, and God the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. I invite you to enjoy the post. Thank you.